Growing up is hard. Mm-hmm. You know, growing up requires you going through some pains, and I, and I was avoiding those pains. Mm-hmm. And you have to eventually deal with them if you're going to stay alive. Right. You know? Right. The people that that do themselves in, they don't have to deal with anything. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to the show, and thanks for tuning in. I want to let you know how much I appreciate you joining us on our show today. If you missed last week's interview with singer-trombonist Aubrey Logan, you can hear it and all of our episodes on entertalkradio.com slash making it or download our app and take us with you. Also, be sure to tune in to hear my upcoming conversations with actor-comedian-singer Robert Klein, Italian saxophonist Johnny Vancini, choreographer, singer, actress, Tony Basil, and Emmy Award-winning composer, guitarist, Snuffy Walden. I'd also like to thank the companies that help me sound my best, whether I'm performing live or in the studio recording and producing music. Blue Microphones, Taylor Guitars, the Dario Strings and Planet Waves, Seymour Duncan Pickups, Mesa Boogie Amps, Motu Digital Performer, IK Multimedia, and Exotic Effects. So often I get asked questions about the creative process, so I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the music business. You're really in for a treat as I've invited my friends, some of the best and brightest in music, to share their stories on how they have influenced the music that has shaped our lives. I guarantee you're going to love it. So let's get started. My guest today is bassist, singer, songwriter, and fashion icon, Will Lee. Will Lee is an American bassist known for his work on The Late Show with David Letterman. Born in San Antonio, Texas, Lee has recorded and toured with countless legendary artists and performs with his Beatles tribute band, The Fab Faux, which he co-founded in 1998. Lee's path in music was influenced by both of his parents. His father, William Franklin Lee III, played trumpet, piano, and upright bass. His mother sang with big bands. Lee took up drums after seeing the Beatles on The Ed Sullivan Show, and by the time he was 12, had formed his first band in Miami. The band members each earned nine hours a night playing the popular surfing tunes of the 60s. Lee's formal music education was at the University of Miami, where he studied French horn for a year, and then switched to a bass major. After classes, he worked on bass fundamentals, listening to artists like The Beatles, Stevie Wonder, Jimi Hendrix, Steve Miller, The Rascals, Motown, and Sly and the Family Stone, among others. In 1982, Lee became one of the original members of the world's most dangerous band, the house band on NBC's Late Night with David Letterman. He holds the distinction of playing with Paul Schaefer on both Late Night and The Late Show longer than any other member of the CBS Orchestra. Will Lee has been awarded the Naris MVP Award for Bass Guitar in 1979, 1982, and 1985 through 1987, the Naris MVP Award for Male Session Singer, 1987, the Naris MVP Virtuoso Award for Bass Guitar, 1989, and was recognized in the Musicians Hall of Fame and Museum, 2014. Please welcome my guest, Will Lee. Hello. Hello, Will. Hey, Terry. Good nice to, be to see here. you. Wow, that sounds impressive. Who is that guy? That's you, and it does sound impressive to you me. Gave, you gave me a raise, though. My first band was, we were getting $6 a guy. Oh, really? So, yeah, we were dreaming of nine. Well, you deserve nine. <laughs> <laughs> we you, thought so. You were already setting the bar high. And, and, you know, by the way, that did kind of set the bar for you always, you know, being paid, you know, fairly for your services, if not well. Does that constitute going pro when you make six bucks? I guess it does, right? At that moment, I think you're, you're a professional musician? Yes. Wow. So yeah. that was... That's when I first started doing music for non-honest reasons. Right. <laughs> but the you minute still... I got that first big paycheck of six bucks, I was... That was it. It was over. Working the system from that moment on. Right. But somehow you still managed to keep honesty as part of the formula for, for playing music. Part of the honesty is part of the formula. Part of the... <laughs> <laughs> so that first gig, was that was in Miami at a hotel? Or you know, where... it was like a little... It was like an outdoor 
CYO function, uh -huh. pack, like a picnic, basically. Right. And of course, we didn't have a PA system, so we played surf instrumentals. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a bass player. It was two guitars, and I was playing drums. That, that was, was my band. first band. Also, two guitars, really? drums, and we played at a hotel in Miami Beach. We had uh, prepared three songs. I was, I was a little bit younger than you. We went down to audition with our three songs, and they hired us that day. So we played those three songs. Was it because of the no PA thing? Is that why you were in instrumental? We just didn't know any bass players. Oh, but you did vocals too? I don't even remember. <laughs> did we? Yeah, we must have. We must have. Well, I think we, I was like eight or nine or something. You I mean, can't way too really young. call yourself a pro until you do get a bass player. That's you true. agree? <laughs> I, well, yes. I do yeah, agree. That's when we felt like we were hit hit. Right, and once really I discovered that, there was no turning back. I've oh always God, you know, had bass players in my band yeah. since then. <laughs> I want to I want to take a moment to acknowledge this very cool place that we're at. We're we're in Culver City and we're at the History of Recorded Sound. And this is the only place in the world where we're we're sitting right in front of a record lathe a where lathe. they cut <laughs> vinyl. It's incredible. It really is incredible and this is the the only facility in the world where they still maintain vinyl lathes. So um they make records here but but they also they're keeping this art form alive, and it's so cool that we are here. Well, also, the kids that are buying vinyl are keeping it alive as well. So yeah. how, how would they be able to function without a place like this to, to, they wouldn't. to go ahead and maintain the things that are cutting these vinyl records? They, they, this, this is an incredibly important facility that we're at because it's, it's the, in a way, I believe, the last lifeline to keeping this medium alive, which is, which is vinyl. And just, I mean, just for fun, when I heard where we were coming, I, I brought my first vinyl record from 1988, Bimini. And uh, we're going to play it later after the show. That We already took it out and, and put it up on, on the lathe to hear it the, the way it um, was intended. Uh, but that's a sound you haven't heard in not, a while. Not for a while. The actual real sound of things pulsating the way vinyl makes things that's sound. That's right. right and, and just literally kind of popping off of the, the plastic. So... Um, that's going to be fun. I look forward to that. Um, we are going to be doing a, fu a future episode here and really uh, talk in depth about this facility with the owner, uh, Lee Hor We're going to be speaking to the owner, Len Horowitz, and talking about this facility and getting more into it. Um, you know, I want to start off really this interview with a quote of yours that I read. Uh, my career is a series of lucky accidents mixed with wrong turns, which led to surprises around every corner, driven by a passionate love for music and nurtured by hard work. There's a lot of clarity in that statement. Well, I, it kind of sums up, you know, every move that has happened since I started going for doing what I love, which is, you know, this thing called music. And, and, and it's, it's a pretty broad term, music. And in my mm -hmm. case, I like so many kinds of music that it's that I really, I really don't like being pigeonholed into a category, mm -hmm. so to speak. Right. Because I want to keep things open, and it and it thrills me when jazz people think I'm a rock guy, and when rock people think I'm a jazz guy. Right. You know. I, yeah. I think okay, I I did it. Right. You know. Yeah. So it's interesting to uh, to navigate all these different things, and and I think one of the things about playing bass is that you know. Uh, at the very least, you can you can have you can get away with playing roots on the downbeat. Mm -hmm. You know that's something that really makes a strong foundation for music. Mm -hmm. You know it's not the most creative thing in the world, but at the very least, you can actually get through all kinds of music by doing that, that right thing. Right. And then once you get inside a genre, say you're doing reggae or you're doing country or you're doing anything else, gospel or whatever it is you can think of, you find yourself you know, feeling freer and freer within it the more you get familiar with it. So that's mm -hmm. when you start taking some chances and right. putting, not putting the downbeat there. Right, and right, right. Just little different things, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden you're like, you know, once you've, you've learned that the downbeat thing is, is so easy, I'm ready to move on, then you go ahead and move on. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes really fun. Right. Yeah. So here's a question for you. I, I, I know that because you went to school and you had wonderful training, you have a lot of facilities, sometimes perhaps more than you even uh, use when you're playing, which is part of the beauty of your playing. It's something I really appreciate when I hear you play. And is was that ever hard for you to 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 kind of bring it back to center and not be afraid to play simple, but really just make it about the feel and 
and the sound and the emotion and yeah when i was really young you know you had all this energy you know right. that's why you see kids doing this on the guitar right. Right, right. and to them that's playing right you know? but not everybody wants to hear that all the time mm-hmm. so <clears throat> excuse me it's good to um to uh to be aware of of that that you're doing that it's good to try to to take control of it you know? mm-hmm. and uh, it's also good to put to keep a producer's hat on and listen to the the overall project and see if it, it is is what I'm playing is all that stuff helping shape it in a good way or is it taking away from what the message of the song is mm-hmm. you know? so sometimes it's good to add a little something and right. sometimes it's good to step way out of the way right my ultimate goal these days and has been for a long time is to be like Ringo on bass right which I've never heard anybody say before. <clears throat> well, think about what he added and didn't add. Well, he only added to the Beatles' writing because he right. he would provide an, an amazing feel right. uh, to a songwriter's piece of music. Right. And he would either uh, strengthen what was there by keeping it simple mm-hmm. or he would find something, a spot where it needed, where where it was necessary to add something interesting and he would do that mm-hmm. you know so he found this great he was kind of always walking the, the tightrope of that you know right and always sort of uh either you know either adding extra notes or adding extra groove mm-hmm. but always making the song better right because it was always about playing the song yeah so wouldn't it be great to to have that as your craft you know if you're if you're right. a hired gun Mm-hmm. To, to play on a song, to be able to be the Ringo of your instrument, right? You know, yeah, yeah. And it's you know, I'm I'm also thinking about you know one of the other parts of the team, obviously Paul McCartney, the b- bass player, who I know you have become friends with, you know, in your career, but also he has influenced your playing um, as well as many others. But but you know, to me, he's the guy that kind of brought the counter melody, mm-hmm. you know, the uh, melodic approach. You know, in in a sense, even a kind of a classical point of view to it by coming yeah. up with one more hook. It is playing and is singing. And it's playing and singing. Equally. Yeah, I mean, he uses all of melodicism, melodicism in his bass playing. Right. You know that he had inherent. That yeah. Enabled him to be the writer that. Yes. Yeah. You know. But the the fact that you played drums when you were you know and you still do, but that was one of your first instruments. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, makes me kind of smile and understand why you would use that analogy that you want to be the Ringo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'd, I'd love to be the Ringo on drums. On drums, right. <laughs> but that's already happened. Right. He did that. And nobody will ever be able to quite do that. No. But, you know, a lot of people either have the feel or the taste. Right. You know, or the licks. Or right. the in-between licks. But very few have all three going for them and know where to put them and when. Yeah. It's amazing. I want, I want to talk about your mom and dad for a minute because I know that they were both accomplished musicians and I'm wondering how they encouraged or discouraged you from following the path of being a musician. Um, it was, you know, in our household there was always music playing. Mm-hmm. And, and in fact it was always jazz. Mm-hmm. It was always kind of Miles Davis style jazz. Right. You know, sometimes it was Cannonball, Adderley, Nancy Wilson... A lot of Sarah Vaughan, a lot of Miles. Mm-hmm. And, in fact, that's the first sound that I remember hearing musically was the sound of Miles Davis' harmon mute trumpet. Right. That's the first awareness that I can, you know, think back. and, and As a really young remember. boy, little kid. Yeah. Right. Like walking into a, a party that my parents were giving, and I'd be in my pajamas, and, Mom, I need some milk. <laughs> you know? and, and they had their the hi-fi sound. on. There'd be the sound. <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So that's really the, literally yeah. the first thing. So there was a lot of jazz. My dad was a bebop piano player, you know, uh, not as professional as he might have been had he not be- become an educator because mm-hmm. he was he was deep into playing for a long time. He was in Gene Krupa's band, mm. you know. Um, playing piano or trumpet? Yeah, uh, pian- as okay. a pianist. Right. He, he stopped playing trumpet only because he had contracted uh, tuberculosis mm. during the, the early 50s, I think. Okay. In fact, he was in uh, the Fourth Army Band with a guy named Vito Farinella, mm-hmm. who also t- known to the rest of the world as Vic Damone, who just ah. passed away a couple of days ago. Yeah. He was my godfather. Wow, Vic was. <laughs> yeah. 
That's pretty wonderful. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Um, so those, there was a whole jazz thing going on in our house, and often my mother, who was also a singer in, in jazz big bands at, mm -hmm. at times, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's any other kind of big band. At, well, <laughs> <laughs> is that a redundancy? And was this in Texas or when yeah, they had already moved to this Miami? Was, this was Texas right. mostly. And uh, they would sometimes play and perform together at these parties. And mm -hmm. that was amazing too. Yeah. You know, so the great thing that I learned from, from all of this, really the, the, the really most important thing of anything I learned from, uh, from, from just being at home and, and experiencing life while this music was playing was groove. Mm. From jazz records, because, yeah, yeah, because there was always a, a great groove. Yeah, so my body kind of learned what a great groove is supposed to feel like. Right, you know. Yeah, and that went into everything. Right, that I do. Mm -hmm. You know, musically. Yeah, no matter what the style is, if if it's grooving, I'm I'm there. I'm good. I'm good to go. Yeah, me too. So that's yeah. that. That's a pretty general statement. Mm -hmm. That's why, kind of any music is okay with me as long as it's grooving you know right and in tune helps as well yeah <laughs> <laughs> I like that too it does <laughs> uh, so you are William Franklin Lee the fourth fourth which may I didn't fourth be with you may yes. the fourth be with you tell me about one two and three uh, well you know there was dad right there was Gramps mm -hmm. Junior you, did you call a, him Gramps yeah, yeah. he was a he, he was a, a weekend musician who played saxophones all the saxophones mm-hmm uh, tenor, alto, Barry, and he um, was a he worked at a, a, a tugboat company in Galveston, Texas. Wow! By by you know, during the week, uh -huh. that was his income. Was he a builder or a captain? He was a, a bookkeeper. Ah, yeah. So I think his bookkeeping. I have none of this, none of these skills, by the way, none of this mm -hmm. money skills. I know nothing about. It. Well, you do have a money skill of knowing how to attract money. I don't even know what that is. I just play. Okay. And yeah. then but the, but the rest the, comes. But the thing yeah. that those guys had, they weren't doing gigs that made up a, a bunch of bread, mm -hmm. but they had this amazing ability to save and stuff. And right. Put things into like a little, you know, whatever you call it that I don't even know the name. It's of. called a bank account. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> or a piggy that bank. That sounds yeah. professional. Right. One of those things. Yeah. yeah. Like a big piggy bank that's right. shaped like a building. That's, yeah, that's it. That's yeah. it. <laughs> With a bunch of guys in suits inside, <laughs> watching your money. Yeah, so they were they were great about that, and and somehow my dad was able to raise four kids, you know, being mm. an educator. Wow! Because he had this certain thing. I wish he had taught me some of that money stuff. Yeah. Because I I kind of just know that my basic thing is I know that if I'm working, I, I I'm going to make money. Right. Right. That's about and that's and about if you're not working, deep as it then goes. you need to find some work. <laughs> yeah, I get right to the chorus. I right. Don't fill in all those frilly verse lyrics. Right. I just know the chorus. The hook. Kinda, yeah. Yeah. I write. I, I go. I live by the hook. But you know, my my dad was a teacher also. Both my parents were actually not music, um, but I didn't get a lot of money lessons from them. So it, I don't know that that necessarily fell in with being an educator. But did they know? You, well, yes. They had a sense about it. They, absolutely, you're right. Yes. But it never got they spoken, balanced it. spoken about. No. No, they didn't they really. They just did it. Yeah. Although, I mean, did you have a, did you mow lawns or clean pools? I mean, that's what we did in Miami. I tried to, to make do some that money a as a bit. kid and so you could buy a I bicycle. Paper or, route. Okay. I worked at a publishing company. So you learn some early responsibility about if you want something, you work and then you save up for it. Yeah, I think my dad gave me the best lesson I ever had. He, he knew that there was. That Gable's music had a white Fender Precision bass in the window that he knew I wanted for Christmas. Mm -hmm. And when I woke up Christmas morning, there was this, this really sad brown Japanese knockoff bass right. in the living room. And I just thought, man, I get, I'll show him. Oh. And within two months, I had made enough money to buy the good one. Wow. With your paper around? Or yeah. Or what nice. And boy, did that feel good. Yes. You know? Yeah. I was mad at him. But then I realized you, you how important it. that was yes. that he did. It made me What work a beautiful for lesson. It. So, you know, if you, if you earn something like that, you, op you open up the case and you just smell it. You know, right. And you just, oh, yeah, man, I made this happen. This is great. Yeah, you know, yeah. You just feel good. Do you still, do you still have that base? No. I, yeah. It went through a lot of uh, Renovations and, right. Renovations for days. Right. Well, that was the learning one. Sand it off all the finish. Yeah. I made it natural. It was beautiful. <laughs> 
Um, we both spent our early lives in Miami. You know, your family moved. How old were you when you I moved? was there for six years from 64 till 71. So you were, uh, what, for? I was like 14, 11, 11 till, yeah. or, or 12 to 18. Okay. Something like that. So formative years. Yeah. Um, did you enjoy those years in Miami or well, were you sad okay. about leaving Texas? No, but the thing was that, you know, I started getting into music as a, as a thing after school thing, mm-hmm. starting in Miami. It was post Beatles, and uh, I was really inspired to do some music on my own and make a band with people and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So I got frustrated that the Miami audience w- weren't the type of uh, the, the people that the people that paid you to play gigs were not the kind of people that wanted to hear anything other than covers. Right, right. They weren't really interested in original material. Mm-hmm. So that was that was a discouraging uh, message coming from the Miami. And you were already writing songs as a in high school. Well, yeah, high school? we were. Do, yeah, we were in bands doing original music, right? And we were surprised at how difficult it was to to get paid to do that, right? You know, and I understand it, of course, because right. you know nobody wants to think about that band that's playing; they just want to dance, right? Right. right. So you know, we played a lot of fraternity parties and mm-hmm. things like that, and clubs mm-hmm. and it was always the same thing they never wanted to hear any anything but stuff they were familiar with and it made you wonder well how did they get familiar with it in the first place if they didn't want to hear it right it was for, original at one point hmm. right so you know i guess that's a lesson in like uh saturating radio waves with a thing over and over again. yeah maybe yeah maybe did you were you one of the bass players that went through the wayne cochran and the cc riders no but i band? used to my, our bands would open up for those. Oh, guys. you did! Oh, fun! Yeah, yeah. And, and this is pre-Jocko, by the way. Right. Yeah. This is I left before Jocko was was mm-hmm. the guy who people were talking about. But as soon as I got to New York, I started hearing this buzz about Jocko right. Pastorius, right? The, the great Jocko, the big bassist Jocko Pastorius. Mm-hmm. And now I had gotten to New York and started taking a lot, of, getting a lot of studio work. And as, I, more so as a singer or bass player or both. Bass player. Almost simultaneous. Because you were singing uh, jingles back then as well. Yeah, but the bass, bass thing was the very first part okay, of it. Okay, right. And, and there were a lot more bass things to do throughout a day. Mm-hmm. And then I would sing on like a version of, of something that was within a campaign for an ad for something or whatever. But, right. But then I would play all the versions in right. bass, and I learned a lot about, about technique and a styles. lot about you know styles. And I also learned that simplicity was key. Right. Right, right. Mm-hmm. That's when I really started to get lessons about being, being simple, playing simple parts. Right. So when I got down to Miami for a one of many return visits, there was a guy who was following Jaco Pastorius around. Mm-hmm. This is a side story. You want to, might want to edit this out, but mm-hmm. but he would present. This shows about the truth. So. He would okay. show up with with a Tascam or some kind of a a reel to reel tape machine, and mm-hmm. he had played. He had recorded Jaco with the Wayne Cochran band. He right. said, man, you got to hear this, you got to hear this. And, and I was going, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And he, would fi- he finally cornered me and sat me down and mm-hmm. turned the tape machine on. And I'm listening to this, and, I'm, and what I'm hearing is a guy doing exactly what I'm trying to learn how to not do. Right, which is overplay. <laughs> yes. I'll say it. And I just yeah. said, you know, please turn that off. Right. <laughs> I just don't want to hear this. Cause it's, you know, yeah. of course, it's fun to overplay, but yeah. I really want to hear that. Right. So... Uh, it wasn't until later that I f- that I heard Jocko in the in the element of like where he, where he really could shine the best, right. and I don't mean shine by 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 playing more notes than anybody else in the whole band. I mean right. a guy who was really working out some cool stuff within a jazz format. Right, right. So I heard him with Iris Sullivan. Oh, and I was a devotee from that moment. Yeah, on. yeah. And I met him. Yeah, and he was the sweetest, most wonderful guy. Mm-hmm. Also, yeah, and always really supportive positive you know mm-hmm. and that was a wonderful thing to find out that this guy who who could do all that and change the course right of the mighty river of bass guitar right was also a wonderful person mm-hmm. you know? do you feel that you've been also one of the contributors to changing the course of the the mighty river i have no idea mm-hmm. <laughs> have okay no idea you're just that. playing yeah i think you are I, th- I think of you well, thanks. as I don't, that. I don't know if you're thinking of anything in particular, but, you know. I'm, th- I'm just thinking of, of the arc of your whole career before we, I mean, w- you know, we've known each other for a few years, but, you know, before we met, 
uh, you know, I certainly followed you as a musician, and and um, you know, I, I I think it's just your your body of work and your flexibility. Like you s- said, you haven't been pigeonholed, and you haven't wanted to be. So, um, you know, I've I've just always thought of you as an exemplary musician. You know, and I th- th- I mean that's one of the qualities that I think of somebody who changes the course of of music. And and also, I mean, you've had the opportunities, uh, and you've stepped up. They're they're deserved. But to to participate in creating a lot of pop music, mm-hmm. you've played on yeah. a lot of re- a lot of records. Yeah, I was thinking about. Uh... Barry Manilow this morning. Right, yeah. And I couldn't get the song Can't Smile Without You right. out of my head. Yeah. I woke up with... <laughs> <laughs> in yeah. my head, I was like, oh no, yeah. here it comes again. I'll never be able yeah. to get rid of that. But, that, but, so the, but here's an example, because you might not know this, but but like when I'm speaking to Barry Manilow, and like I'll, I'll mention, uh, like I told Barry, after you and I played in New York a few months ago, and, and, I, was, and I saw him at one of his shows, and... And I said, "Oh, I just played with Will Lee, and it was great." And he just lit up, oh, and just and he said, guy. "I love recording with with Will." And yeah, you know, so um, yeah, we have I want to share a that good with long you. history. So, yeah. yeah, we made a lot of nice records. Absolutely. So, you know, and he's that's the real deal. He's a musician. He's a total. Yeah, he he knows all about that stuff. Yeah, arranging, orchestration. Yes. You know, he's like not just a, a singing icon. No, that's kind of the least of it. Yeah, true. Yeah. He really understands, you know, his career is no accident, let's put it that way. Yeah, that makes sense. Because when, when I've asked Barry about it, he goes, I, I, I never thought that I would be a singer. I don't even know how that happened. You know, but I like that you said that's no accident. Yeah, he went for it and it was great. Yeah, yeah the door opened and he went through it. Um, let's talk about this. This is an is what's known as a CD. It used yeah. to be a thing that people would put into a machine and it would uh, make sound. Oh, they used to have but them on computers is too. Files, before, right? Uh, <laughs> way before MP3s. Appropriate, way before, right? Way before streaming. Yeah. This is um, your most recent album. We still call them albums. I think it is. Yeah. Um, Love, yeah, gratitude, and other distractions. Um, what are a couple of those other distractions that you were talking about in the song? Or the album title. Oops, my mic just fell out of my pocket. It's okay, we'll fix that. I hope you can still hear me. Um, well, the, the, the joke of that is that what's more important than love and gratitude? Right. Right? That's yeah. the joke. Yeah. That's really the only thing that that means. It's like love, gratitude, and a other bunch of <laughs> crap, you know. <laughs> but that's that's really to put emphasis on how important it is to... To, to have love, and actually, I think gratitude is something that really leads towards having love. You know? I do, too, and I think gratitude is a very underrated um, quality that um, it, or is lacking. I don't, I don't know how a lot of people. it could be uh, thought of as, as being any more important than it is, or any less important than it is, because it's so... I agree, you know, well. It just changes your... Your entire outlook, which, right. of course, your outlook is your most important, is your strongest asset. Right. You know, if your outlook is uh, is healthy and, and positive and good, mm-hmm. and and that's up to you to make it that way. Of right. Course. You know, you may think, you may think, oh man, nothing's going to work and everything's bad. But if you if mm-hmm. you can if you can see it just a little bit differently, you're going to feel completely different all over mm-hmm. and you're gonna that's gonna open the door for a crazy thing like love you know right right, <laughs> right? it does because yeah. all of a sudden you, yeah. you won't be you won't be filled with all this negativity and you'll also uh, start digging yourself which is really the, the key right. to being able to love I think what, did you always have a strong sense of gratitude growing up or is it something that came later in life I'm sure it came later Sure, it came later. Because I mean, right. you know, I, okay. as far as music goes, I always felt like, I guess this is a form of gratitude. Whenever I was in any musical situation, I don't care what we're talking about, mm-hmm. um, I always felt like because I was there, this is the place to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Here's an opportunity to play music and make music with people. This right. is unbelievably great. Right. You know? Right. A great example was. Uh, and I remember really distinctly getting a gig to play a a thirty five dollar gig with the Larry Elgart Orchestra, mm-hmm. a society gig, I mm-hmm. guess you could call it. I don't even know what who, what the audience was, and, and yeah. I wasn't concerned with that. I was more so excited about the music itself, right? And and the sound we would all make together, yes, right. 
Yeah. <clears throat> and I'm in a I'm in a like an old old Cadillac, I guess, with about six guys, mm -hmm. and we're driving to Canada. <laughs> It's from like New York, eight or ten hours, or from each Miami, way to make the thirty-five bucks from New York City. Okay. And these guys were wow. drinking in the car, and they were so miserable. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, guys, I'm thinking, like, we're going to go make some music. Right. What the hell's going on here? Right. This is the greatest. What's right. wrong with you people? Right. You know. <laughs> <laughs> My first tour was like that. I, I I played with Billy Preston and and Sarita Wright, 1981. It was wow. amazing. And I, so I was beside myself. One of my all-time favorite. Billy. Ever. Oh, yeah. Billy Preston. Absolutely. And to go to Europe with him, to go to England and Germany. We spent a month in Germany. What year? 81. Man, he was at the top of his game. Yes. Oh, my God. Um, yes. And, you know, I thought I knew something about music because I went to music school. I knew nothing until, like, I found that out the first show. It's like, all right, now oh, I'm going to begin. Were lucky. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm going to learn how to play music. And, but... I remember, like, we were on the plane, on the bus, we're all there, and I'm thinking, this is so great. And, you know, people are complaining and whining. It's like, I can't wait to get home again. And it, it made no sense to me. You know, some of the other musicians in the band. They needed so. to figure out how to, how to make themselves happy on the road. Right, like. yeah. Because they were in an opportunity that, you know, how, what percent of, of humanity gets to be in those shoes to play with Billy Preston? I know. And I thought about that because I remember, I'm not sure if you've had this experience, I would imagine so, but, but leaving from LAX and being on a plane, leaving at night to head overseas and looking at all these twinkling lights of houses below and thinking, how many guitar players are down there? How did, you know, how did I get this besides tenacity and desire and passion and, and, you know, and maybe some luck? But, but you know, I was thinking about the, the percentage of that, you know, what I mean, what do you think makes I, I don't even know how to ask this question, but what separates you from other musicians that, that people would want to choose you? Why do you right. think? I mean, it's kind of odd without bringing ego into it, but I'm just talking from an observational point of view. Yeah, I guess a lot of it is, is how do people get chosen to, to be the anointed ones that you get to play on a, a TV show it, for yeah, years? A lot or? of it is your, your excitement level about it, You're, right approach which, which makes you a dedicated person who could, therefore is a reliable person right. and therefore a, a person who plays the parts correctly. Right. You know, uh, all that stuff right. is so important. And, and you know, a guy so like Billy Preston, yeah. he probably just wants to know that he doesn't have to worry about any of that stuff. Right. He can be Billy Preston right. without all the hassle of like, oh God, is this guy, you know, is he, is he a flaky? Mm hmm is he negative? You know, we don't yeah. get that energy pulling away from what I'm trying to do here. Right. So the support system you right. know, becomes like something that's really a strong, like a pillar pillar underneath him. Right. And that's what he needs. He doesn't really, even, you know, he may not even uh, consci conscientiously or consciously think about that. He but intuitively recognize yeah. something well, in gonna, himself that he sees in other people. He's not going to know how good it is, but, he, but he's certainly going to know when there's a problem. Right. You know, that's going to really right. get his attention. Right. And then, you know, He's going to have to replace that person who right. becomes that problem. Well, you had that experience when you first moved to New York and you had the opportunity to audition for a band that you were a big fan of. Absolutely. Dreams. And, Dreams, yeah. yeah. And already knew their music inside out. They were like, what? <laughs> I don't think they realized how important, they didn't know how important they were to me, right. obviously. Yeah. You know? I mean, they knew they were just guys trying to get gigs and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. And their, their record, their first album had changed my whole thing i thought they were the next beatles right yeah you know because i was that into the music so what was that audition like for you were you nervous or excited or both i don't even know how to describe it i had had a bad experience during that afternoon by uh smoking a joint and mm -hmm. getting really out there before the audition yeah okay and having a jam with the keyboard player don gromick <laughs> Oh, Don was in that band. I forgot. And, and, wow. and he and the drummer, yeah. uh, a, a drummer, and I. Not it wasn't the yeah. drummer from Dreams because that was Billy, right. Billy Cobble. Right. But we we played this jam and, and it really went nowhere. <laughs> so I thought, and and I and the right. look on his face was like, oh my god, we're wasting our time. We could, this guy flew all the way, all the way from Miami and it's right. a dud, you know. Right. But I get to the rehearsal studio and I'm like wide eyed and just 
in awe because we're passing by all these cases that say Miles Davis, Santana, right. Johnny Winter. Yeah. You know, I'm like, yeah. oh, my God, what's happening to right. me? You know, right. I get, I get in the room, and and they said, how do you do, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. This is Mike Brecker. This is Randy Brecker. Right. Hey guys, how you doing? And this is Billy Cobham and so-and-so, Bob Mann. <laughs> so um, they said, uh, here, here's some music. They, they had a big, I remember it was a green, like a score. Mm-hmm. Of you know of their tunes, right? The kind of thing that was so big that it was like four bars per page, you know, right? Keep turning it if you wanted to. I said, guys, let me. I, I think I may not need this. Just count it off. Let's see what happens. Yeah. And Billy Cobham counts off some of this, one of their tunes. Yeah. And it, I just felt like I was floating, free floating. Right. Because first, yeah. first yeah. of all, I'd come from a place where there were no Billy Cobhams in Miami. Right. I didn't. This was the yeah. first time in my life that I didn't have to feel like I had to keep the time. You weren't driving the bus. Right. All I had to do was play bass. Right. To some of my favorite material. Right. So it was just so fun and easy. Yeah. And the fact that I sang a little bit right. made them like really excited because they were a, a, some, a semi-vocal band and, and Clive Davis mm-hmm. was the record company president pressuring them to be more commercial. Right. Which so means have love, a singer in pop tune. They, or... they love the fact that I could sing as right. well. Right. So I, I just kind of never looked back. Right. I just stayed. And at that point, you already knew that you were a singer as well as a bass player. Well, I'd been, the funny thing is I'd been a lead singer since the drumming days, okay. since before I became a bass player. Right. And All that right. was a big shock to switch to bass and still try to be the lead singer. Yikes. Yeah. <laughs> That's a whole nother thing. Right. From playing drums to Well, it's already a big pattern. yikes playing drums. and Yeah, that's, but that's just the thing over and over again. Right, right. right. But wow, to play this pattern. Yes. The patterns. And, oh, my God. It's the whole thing. So you, you know, it's funny. So you, you, if you get thought of as being that guy, you know, more of that generates itself. Right, right, right. You know, people will start assuming. And then... For me, I, I find that like each new tune that I have to learn is like starting back from the beginning again mm-hmm. each time because you got to learn one part and then you got to learn the other part. Right. So you, you learn right. the bass thing, so you kind of have to park that on the back burner. Do you learn the so bass thing first? So your vocal can deliver the, mel- the message of the song. Yeah. I mean, I, you... think, I think, yeah, like in the Fab Faux right. to get those Beatles songs down. Oh, that, that makes sense. I think that... So the that becomes to second nature really for you? Really learn the bass part. Yeah, it has to. Yeah. A little bit. So that you can you know. focus on the singing. And then once the singing thing gets comfortable, then you can go back and like really focus on, on locking in with the drums even mm-hmm. better as a bass player. Right. You know. let's, since you brought it up, let's talk about the Fab Faux. You co-created the group. Mm-hmm. Uh, Where did the idea come from? Um, <clears throat> it's funny. I never thought of doing any Beatle band because, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's kind of... It, it's almost silly sometimes where these guys dress up and. Well, you know. and just for the record, for anybody who hasn't seen the Fab Four or heard them, you guys aren't. You, you, you don't try to look like the Beatles. As a matter of fact, you don't try to do it with just four guys because you're. you're you, what you're doing is you're honoring the songs, the the arrangements, the production. You're going. We're honoring the recorded. The version. recorded versions. You go full in because it was a recording band. Yeah, I mean they well, weren't really. Eventually, they were only a recording. Band. Right. Yeah. So 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 I love Fab Faux because it's just like putting the record on, and all and, the but parts are there. Right? They're all there. Everybody sings, and and not just sings a little. There, I mean, there's so much talent in in. There's some your, great singing. Your group, yeah, and <clears throat> um, but you still get the 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 joy, the thrill I do in the audience of. Um, you know, being experiencing the performance, the energy of that too. So, just but I wanted to clarify that this isn't like a couple four mophead guys. <laughs> These are like really wonderful musicians, players, singers, recreating the recorded versions of these songs. Yeah, there's so much magic in those records. Yeah, you know that that's the thing that I got excited about doing. What if we bring the records to the stage? You know, yeah, how great would that be? And yeah. I met a guy, and I never thought about it ever mm-hmm. until I met. The drummer Rich Bagano, who who had a very Ringo-y sense of of, of touch and mm-hmm, time, mm-hmm. and really understood that thing. Right. But he also sang. Yeah. In a way that reminded me of John Lennon. Yeah. So I thought. That's interesting. Wow. A Beatle bringing some Beatles records to the stage would be really great with this guy, 
and I think I really would love to have Jimmy Vivino mm -hmm. in the band because mm -hmm. he's a real archivist and knows a lot about right. recorded music as well. Yeah. And and then after that, I I only knew that I wanted to have five people because I'd learned as a studio singer singing group in the studio mm -hmm. the magic of doubling. Right. How forgiving that is. Right. So and, and to me, a lot of the Beatles records have this kind of gang vocal sound anyway. Mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be great if you instead of like one guy singing a song just because John sang it on the on the record have another guy also be John so get, to get that doubled sound that the record has right you know? yeah so it's a live double track so yeah. a five person band seems so much more logical because then you could also have those great other textures like percussion parts and right. keyboard parts and stuff right. you know and it and it got to be really fun it's, we've been doing it for 20 years mm -hmm. I was watching one of the... I love that, 20 years. 20 years ago today? Yeah, it's perfect. I was watching one of the, your live recording videos. Uh, I forget which of the Beatles record it was, but you, you cut a whole... Um, you recreated a whole album doing it live and videotaping. And it was chore choreographed to the point where your um, piano player, I think it was your piano player, was playing something, and one of your texts came and h just handed him a tambourine for the right part of the song so that he could just pick it up and hit that part. Right. I mean, every, it you're not... It requires more than just five guys, Yeah, sure. you're thinking about yeah. everything. How do we make this happen? Yeah, it, those are really important things to, to do in, in these situations. You have to have that extra extra tech or two right. actually handing and taking away things and putting things on you right during the songs yeah. or or just right right as you're going well a great example i guess would probably be the abbey road medley to mm -hmm. try to do it strung together right you know they were all recorded separately i guess right? yeah yeah i would expect and, and overdubbed upon and all that other stuff yeah. so it's really necessary to make those moves if you want to keep it flowing in real time mm -hmm. yeah it would be impossible otherwise did you just read the uh, the Quincy Jones <laughs> little quote? Speaking of Beatles, um, I, I <laughs> I've, I've heard some quotes. Yeah, I yeah. I, I read a few. Um, and the thing that keeps going through my head is is a guy going, "You kids get off my lawn." <laughs> right. That's all I can think about when I think about right. this because I don't understand. Yeah, Quincy Jones is such an open minded. Absolutely, yeah. I always His thought. reference was if, was that the Beatles were not great musicians. Uh, th that's the paraphrase, um, but but to it's my surprise, like my dad would say right, like that. yeah, get yeah. off of my lawn. But but the the thing that surprised me because he is so open minded is that there wasn't the. But additionally, they were innovators of of thinking of ways to cut tape and create things that hadn't happened yet. I have no idea what he's referring to. You know. Yeah. Unless he never listened to any Paul McCartney beyond the first time he picked up a bass or something. Right, yeah. I don't either. I because, was a little surprised. Because Paul yeah. McCartney has informed so much in pop music by, oh, you know, even if you took him a, took just his bass playing aside and singled that out as right. a thing. Right, right. Not to mention his drumming and piano playing and guitar oh playing. Oh, my goodness. And, yeah. I mean, the writing and the singing and the harmonies and the... You know, where does it all come from? Well, come on, Blackbird, him and a metronome, and, you know, and it, it holds to this day. I wish I could be that horrible. <laughs> I want to... Right. You know, if I should live long enough. Yeah. Well, whatever. Any, I don't know what that is. I, don't, I have no idea. It, yeah. does, it doesn't really register. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, right. compute. Anyway, Fab Faux is such a wonderful... Um, it's a band. You we know, it's a group moments. of... Yeah, you do. Yeah, it's really fun. It's a, you know, it's always challenging because we're always Schedule mixing wise. it up so much. Oh, or just you're pushing the envelope with the we material. mix it up so much that we surprise ourselves mm -hmm. at every turn. You know? Right. We don't ever play the same things two nights in a row. Right. So it's always like you're always on edge. Who's calling the the show? Well, we we base the shows on what we've done in towns in in the past. Mm -hmm. You know. Oh, right. Things like that. So we don't want to bring the same thing. Yeah. So people. Keep coming out knowing they're going to get a little bit something new. Up, yeah, yeah. Or like you added the horn section one of the last times that I saw you guys play here in LA, and that was fun. 
Yeah, we love that. Yeah. Horn strings, the whole thing. Right. Those are the things that made the record so magical. That's right. But these four-piece bands miss out on them, mm -hmm. unless, unless they're playing to a track. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other thing. We that's don't want to do that. No, no, you guys play live. We want some warts and all. Kind yeah. Of, you know, if there's a mistake, that's that's rock and roll. Well, there were mistakes in the original recordings, too. Sometimes we try to cop those. Right, you do. Yeah. Yeah, that's always an Absolutely. interesting point of conversation. Do we? How authentic do we want to be? All the way. Right. For my I love that. Yeah. yeah. That's great. You can't fix the Beatles. So. No. That's part of the charm of, of what makes it work. I, I, uh, I saw a tweet of yours on your, your website, and it, and it said, A moment of peace, a butterfly in an orange tree at planet Earth. Is that a good description of life in New York? For you, or just that was just a moment of that was Venice Beach. That was Venice. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah New York uh, doesn't have as much of that. It doesn't. I haven't seen one orange tree in New York ever. Yeah, that's why it, that's it caught my attention. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you, let me ask you. I want to keep it moving because there's so much I want to talk about. Do you have a go-to bass that you bring when you get on an airplane? Is I bring it? my Sadowski. You do. I have a, there's a Will Lee model that I help design with him. Right. And uh, you know, and it's it's a four-string, mm -hmm. and it's based on a jazz bass, and it's uh, you know it's got a certain mid-range circuitry in it that that helps the bass really speak in all kinds of situations. Right. It's got an extra fret. It's got like a 22 fret. Oh, it that. does. Yeah. A couple extra frets mm -hmm. compared to a traditional. And it's got a hip shot detuner, which gives me a range of uh, almost what a five string does, except four strings. Right. So I, I tune it to a C, mm -hmm. a low C, right. on the E string, which is a big stretch, but it really expands the range. Mm -hmm. uh, so let, let's talk about something private and personal, which is that you, you were making reference to getting high before a very important audition that was pivotal in your life. And I know that you went down that road and then you had a period of recovery and that you're doing fantastic now. What's this journey been like for you? Um, it, was, uh, it was very, uh, first of all, it was the begin at the beginning of it, it was all really fun, yeah. of course. And then it got a little way out of control. Mm -hmm. I almost said a little, that's, what is, that's a joke. Yeah. It got totally out of control. And uh, it required that I stop being in a state of denial and come to grips with the fact that I had a problem. I did had a problem that did was, somebody have to point that out to you? Or you well, can't everybody yourself, did. Everybody but, pointed. But you don't want to hear it. Right. You know. Because right. if you have a Jones for something, right. you know, you just want to feed that Jones. You don't want to like, your friends become like a pain in the ass. So, yeah, you, you get know? like a little pissed off so at them. Anybody for Anybody who loves you, you don't want to get rid of. Right. Basically. And it's completely That's backwards. destructive. Yeah. Yeah. And at one point, I realized how bad it had gotten, and I finally asked myself this question one day. One day that I had missed actually three huge sessions in one day, and they were all singing solo finals for TV commercials. And you just didn't different, show? Different spots, different, right. Right. different houses, different jingle houses in New York. Mm -hmm. And this is, a, this is a position that anybody would die to be in. Right. And there I was just thumbing my nose at the whole thing. Mm -hmm. I was completely high. The phone was ringing. I was pretending I didn't hear it. Mm -hmm. And at one point, I just asked myself, are you happy? And I couldn't come up with a yes. And that's when I checked in. I checked into rehab for five weeks. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and what it did for me was, uh, it, first of all, I slept, I slept it off for a while mm -hmm. until I, was, you know, I woke up and I was sober and I had to face everything that I had avoided as far as the years of growing up, like, say, from the age, ages of 15 to 35 or whatever. Mm -hmm. And growing up is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up requires you going through some pains, and I, and I was avoiding those pains. Mm -hmm. And you have, to, you, you have to eventually deal with them if you're going to stay alive. Right, you know? right. The people that, that do themselves in, they don't have to deal with anything. Right, but, but a lot of them are gone now. But, yeah, I wanted to... Uh, I wanted to, to live, and, a, and something that also that happened with me was uh, the late Carlos Vega mm -hmm. did something. He, came, he, saw, he saw how unhappy I was, and instead of trying to lecture me or say, you know, you got to get it together or any of this kind of stuff you don't want to hear, he, he knew, he was wise enough to know that. He put a pair of headphones on my head, and he said, check this out, and he played me this thing that was so beautiful that it made me get on my knees and start bawling like a baby, mm. going, man, if anything can be this beautiful, I want to live. 
and it was Yvonne Lean's Da Kilo Que Use, hmm. a track called Da Kilo Que Use, mm -hmm. Da Kilo Que Use. And at that point, um, I had a real turning point about whether I wanted to live or die, and right. I wanted to live. Mm -hmm. So the, the rehab thing was, was lucky. They, were, they had a space for me. I checked in. I got a sub for the Letterman Show. Mm -hmm. The guy you probably never heard of, Marcus Miller. Yeah, I've heard of him. <laughs> sub for me for five weeks at yeah. the Letterman Show. Thank God. It was yeah. wonderful. That's a good friend. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I came out, you know, having learned that, you know, I have a lot of work to do on myself as far as, uh, you know, dealing with all those years of stuff that I didn't want to deal with. Mm -hmm. The pains of growing up. Right. So I, you know, I kept, I, w I did a lot of meetings and a lot of therapy and stuff like that. Right. And it really kind of worked out in the end. Right. I, I was able to, to, to finally meet the love of my life. Sandrine. You know, yeah. Yeah. Who is a wonderful artist. And she, her book is doing great. She yeah. has a great new book out called Nudescapes. Mm -hmm. She's a photographer. Yeah. yeah Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. It's doing really well. It's a beautiful book. Thank and you. she's I'll a beautiful her. partner for you. Yeah, I really she's, like her. She's better than anything I could have ever dreamed up. Right. Yeah. Will, thanks for doing the show. I have two closing questions for you. The first one is a two part, which is what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? And also, can you share three tips for success that have driven your career? Making it is uh, easy for me to answer because I've finally, you know, after a long time of wondering what that is, I realized that all that really means is being happy, period. Right. Right. If you're genuinely happy, you've made it. Right. That's as I good agree. as you can do in life. Yeah. You know? Three tips for success uh, that have driven my career. Well, first of all, I guess the, the most important one, of course, is uh, do what you love if you can. Mm -hmm. you know? If you can be genuinely dedicated to, to the thing you love, that's important. Mm -hmm. And part two of that is being patient and waiting it out because it, it's you're not going to be successful immediately unless something unbelievable happens to you. So right. if you have the uh, patience to wait it out and you're really serious about loving what it is you do, eventually good things will come to mm -hmm. you. I feel, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, three, at that point, you will be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so full circle. <laughs> We'll all have a happy life. And my, my final question for you is, at this point of your life, with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self? I would say uh, never go near any drugs or alcohol. It's completely unnecessary. And just uh, take good care of yourself. Right. You know, as, as best you can afford to. Thank you, Willie. It's great to see you, you always. Too, Thank you, Terry. Thanks for doing the show. My pleasure. And we're going to close the show out with this beautiful lathe and, and play a cut from my first record. All so, right. yeah. So, um, thank you, everybody, and we'll see you again next week. Again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wolf.